easily treated in, in regional trade agreement. This is why there were some results on that, and perhaps the moderator could say some, some word on, on that if. Uh, <laughs> you oh, you bo your boss, you mean? Okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the cities, I, I, I fully agree that cities in terms of demand, but uh, going back to my cluster approach, I mean, a city by definition is a cluster. Uh, because you will find in the same area ma many people with different talent, etc., etc. So, uh, cities are, are, are the main agent also in this cluster approach. But I, I will not really agree on the fact that nations are disappearing and, and cities are growing because the cultural dimension remains very important. And one of the reasons uh, global value chain were able to, 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 to be such a success that uh, in a global value chain, at the difference of the integrated uh, industry of the early uh, 20th century where you were producing mass thing, uh, indifferentiated, in, in global f uh, value chain, you have the flexibility of adapting your product to, to, to the, the, the demand of the consumer. And I guess the cultural dimension is still very strong. I mean, uh, we, we should not uh, <laughs> don't downplay uh, the, the national dimension, at least for cultural uh, reason. And finally, um, on the disruption of global value chain, uh, the crisis of 2008, 2009 was a big shock. I mean, you refer to, to, to Japan, but I mean, if we go back before, I mean, when, when we had the, the global crisis, it, it spread so fast. Uh, one of the reasons it spread so fast was, was through global value chain, are re-estimating the risk through, uh, and, and so that there are a lot of, of work, I mean, don't want to enter into the, details, but uh, reassessing the, the distribution of probability, you, the, the people speaking about uh, black swans, fat tails, etc., etc., uh, <laughs> where they try to re, uh, rethink the, the management of risk through global value chain. So, I mean, uh, it, it has an impact, in my opinion, on, on the way it's managed. Hold on. Let me then start maybe with this part regarding uh, risk management. In the case of Japan, actually, we, we had a very serious issue because the only manufacturer worldwide of a specific emulsifier, which we use in some product we have, coffee made and other stuff, it was based in the north of Japan, and we basically ran out of product for close to six months. And one of the assessments we had is we had to find basically other sources because we are too dependent on one specific supplier. So, and that's frankly, okay, maybe another subject regarding more globalization is the, you know, the, the just-in-time concept and the over-dependency on fewer suppliers is, is, is definitely increasing the risk, at least uh, that's what I believe. Just regarding the point regarding optimist, maybe, uh, maybe I didn't express myself. I'm an optimist, but I'm not optimist about the future of supply of food in this world. I'm not at all. Um, clearly, uh, water is a big subject, but the big issue in producing food in this world is water. Few people realize that this planet will run out of water, fresh water, decades before we run out of oil. And the last time I check, it's easy to replace oil with something. It might be more expensive, more complex, but we have other resources. Water, so far, HO2 has not been easy to replace with anything. So clearly, we have a uh, big potential, and uh, often said half-jokingly, uh, JFK said once, you know, whoever will solve the problem of water in this world will deserve two Nobel Prize, one for science and one for peace. Uh, because uh, clearly that's that's a, a very big issue which I think we by far not uh, not solved. FT involvement of the business um, in in the case of China less, but in our case, for example, ASEAN. Uh, 25 years ago, we were very much involved in in pushing for ASEAN, uh, which made a lot of sense for for our operations there. Cities. I would m more than talking about cities. I would talk about regions. Um, and it's, it's it, of course, in the case of the food industry, uh, you adapt your offer to uh, the, the, the consumers. And in the case of, you know, you don't sell Nespresso capsules in uh, rural Sichuan. Uh, you try to focus more in, in Hong Kong and Shanghai. 
and we have products focusing on, on, on the rural parts. So we, we really clearly in the, at least the food industry you do have to adapt your strategy to, to specific regions and channels. And the last point regarding IP, uh, interesting IP and impact on supply chain. In the case of China, actually you could reverse the argument by saying uh, China is becoming uh, in some instance such a violator in IP that it's a major source of income for some uh, people. Um, in our case, we have a team doing only uh, IP regulations. Just to give you an idea, last year we had 1,000 police raids. So every day we had three raids. We're talking police raids, huh? <laughs> not just sending an email or uh, police raids <laughs> per day to, to shut down uh, copycats and actually some of our products, big Maggie, big other stuff, being exported in mega large quantities in Africa mostly and a bit in, in Southeast Asia. So uh, it's, it's clearly an issue. Uh, less for us here, but actually more for uh, other countries using China as a base for, for export. Um, we actually, so the questions have, ris have, have, have raised two things that are definitely going to be on the research agenda. I just briefly, very briefly mention them. The first is on the relationship between these regional agreements and supply chains and how, how much policy interference the regional arrangements uh, end up um, visiting on the supply chains. It is a very mixed story and the quality of these agreements varies quite considerably. What we'd like to look at when we get some data on really, we start looking at specific supply chains, see if, if there's a relationship between the, the directions of these supply chains and their, 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 their constitution and the quality of the trade policy arrangements, which in, in many cases will be regional. So that's something we'll definitely look at. On value added and jobs, this is actually, I think it's more complex maybe than, mm. because look, I mean, at the end, the neoclassical economist in me would say, what are you talking about? Wages are just. Well, that's a, a starting point, but not a terribly useful one because wages don't necessarily adjust. But the fact is, when we look at a supply chain, we've got to remember that we're looking at a, just, we're taking a cut. There's the supplier of the supplier of the supplier of the supplier. And you really only get at that if you have a, an input-output table of the, whole, um, of the whole world economy. But unfortunately, those input-output tables tend to be um, very aggregated. But we, we really don't know the relationship between value added and jobs until we get some much more, uh, we need much better data, much clearer, deeper understanding, which is also something we want to do. Patrick, may I, may I make just a few quick comments, just following yeah. my fellow panel? I'll start with value added and jobs. I, I think it's, it's basically um, not just a problem that you externalize all the time and blame the other countries, but a lot of it has to do with an internal. Basically, I don't think the idea of adjusting wages is that realistic in the real world. Mm -hmm. What you really need is side payments. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and the, 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 some, some sort of taxing of the tremendous value added in order to create jobs actually in the local mm -hmm. economy. And, and what Mike Spence has really studied a lot is basically the whole idea of creating jobs in the non-tradable sector in the domestic economy. So when you're actually losing jobs, um, you, you, you can't just say, hey, these guys are taking these uh, tradable jobs. It's really the, the value added which you capture needs parts of it, or great parts of it, needs to be recycled to create jobs in the non-tradable sector. And that, that's, that's, a, that's an issue which is a domestic issue. You can't always blame the foreigner for all the issues. And in, in fact, I, I think we're facing the same thing in China. We, we basically say that we want to capture more value added, which is a great thing. And we blame the, all the uh, factories in the Pearl River Delta for being polluting, blah, blah, blah. But be careful about the amount of jobs that that's creating in China. You don't want to throw 100 million people out of work. You know, the last uh, estimation is that 250 million people inside China doing basically value-added exports. Now, where are you going to employ these people? So my, my view about this rebalancing in China is just a quick diversion. The speed with which China can rebalance depends on a lot of things, like how fast you, de de you know, develop the consumer market and so on. But I think critically it would depend on how fast you can absorb the job losses from the export sector. That means creation of a domestic services economy. 
And how fast you can do that determines on how fast you can do the rebalancing. Anyway, I, I, I think this, this is fascinating, this idea of really looking, linking, you know, distribution of income or uneven distribution income with trade and, and, and value added. And, and that, that is something that we're going to be really studying very hard in, in, in the, in, in the, in, in the um, uh, in FGI. Um, on, on, on value change being drawn too uh, tight, really. Uh, I mean, at the, at the company level, it's obvious that we've over-optimized the supply chain. <laughs> Over the last 20 years, we've just squeezed every last tenth of a cent out of it. And now we realize any external shock, the whole thing, <laughs> you know, the whole thing kind of explodes, right? So what you really need to do is a lot of double sourcing and so on, you know, parallel sourcing, in order to reduce the risk and make the whole system a lot more resilient. You know, not just the, the, the Fukushima problem, but the floods in Thailand also pointed out a lot of issue, and it goes on. Um, I, I think uh, on, on the uh, business uh, um, participation in the regional discussions, I think uh, Anthony Nightingale is leading the charge for Hong Kong on the APEC, APEC Business Advisory Council, and I think ABAC is a very good example of how business could actually interact and interface in a regional uh, uh, discussion. Now, finally, on services, I can't agree with you more. The whole world shifting there. I think we really need to um, be, be really uh, taking the whole services thing head on. But I would go beyond that. I like to remind everybody that um, investments also needs to be looked at in terms of requiring a global regime. Mm -hmm. It's always trade and investments. To me, the two are inseparable. I'm talking about FDI, of course. I'm not talking about portfolio flows. Uh, and, and it's both, it's two sides of the same coin. You keep regulating one or, or having a, a system to deal with one and kind of completely ignore the other is non, nonsensical. I, I remember in the founding of the GATT, they've always said we need to do trade and investment. They did trade first. They never did the other half. Mm -hmm. And it's time for us to do the other half. And I think it's important because it's easier now. We tried in the 80s, the MIA and so the OECD uh, tried, and it failed uh, to do a global regime for investments. But that was in a time when it was, the world was very divided between the investors and the investees. Now it's a lot more nuanced. Who is the investor? Who is the investee? And I think the, uh, uh, it, it, there's a much better chance uh, of, of getting a global regime. And then the final thing I would say is this. You know, what we're talking about here, in my mind, is really a discussion about how the real economy in the world is evolving. You know, how it impacts trade, investment, jobs, etc. Now, there's a whole thing that Andrew and everybody in another room is talking about, this, this massive financial services market. You know, the key is, in my mind, ah, there he is. <laughs> you finished talking about the financial services. Let me finish just one sentence, and which is, the, the way I think the financial services is going to impact the real economy is through something called trade finance. And I tell you, the impact will be immediate. We, we dodged a bullet in 2008. I don't know if you realize. Trade finance was being cut off. And actually, the G20 came to the rescue in the London meeting. We, 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 we keep saying the G20 is a talk shop. In that instance, they actually did the world a great service. The world turned around on a dime in terms of trade finance. And, 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 the, and if we get another Lehman problem, I would watch very carefully the feed through to the real economy via the route of trade finance. And that's something the trade, trade finance, uh, the, the finance area is going to look at, is specifically how do we ring fence the real economy from the financial sector, you know, especially on the continuation of trade finance. Sorry, that's it. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have to stop. But, but there is another session on supply chains in 30 minutes. And so I'm sorry for those of you who didn't manage to get your questions in. You still have another chance. And um, I would just, I would just like to, uh, in, in a traditional manner, thank the panelists very much for for their contribution. Well, thank you very much. That was great. Thanks. Well,
Hey, 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 Hey,